everyone again. It's good to be. It's good to be here. Always love the uh, always love the chatter in the morning. You know, it's always nice when uh, you get some good energy in the room. It's it's really good. So, um, we are glad that you're here. It's a fun it's a fun day just to have uh, child dedication. It's always fun to just uh, celebrate that all together as well. So, we've been we're in the second week of our series. It's called Sunday School. Uh, how many of you grew up going to Sunday school or a version of kids' church? I don't know if you called it Sunday school. Last week, I shared with you, uh, when I think about Sunday school, I think about a few things. One, I think about Bible stories, and so we're branding this basically as uh, looking at some Old Testament Bible stories. We're looking at the story of David or King David uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, I was thinking about my grandfather, who was the Sunday school director at almost every church that he ever attended, it seemed like, and so every time we go to uh, lunch at his house on Sundays after church. He would share with me about the issues that were going on in his Sunday school world at his uh, whatever Baptist church that he was going to. Uh, and then I also think about felt boards, which, you know, I miss one of those. Maybe one of these Sundays we'll buy one just to have the felt people on it so I can stick some people on a felt board next to me and that you will get the benefit of a felt board if you never got to experience that. So maybe not. Who knows? We'll see. But uh, today, so last week we talked about David being anointed by Samuel. And now we're going to look at probably the, one of the most famous stories of, of David, which is David and Goliath. Which uh, I, I, would not, I don't want to assume, but have we, uh, how many of you have heard of the story of David and Goliath before? If not all of us, most of us, yeah. So uh, at this point, uh, this might be the time where you pull out your cell phone and start checking uh, some, some maybe whatever you're interested into, like your Instagram or a score or whatever else you're doing. But I would say, and when we hear, when we come to these stories, uh, especially the ones that we're familiar with, uh, a lot of times we have to be careful just not to to check out uh, mentally because, we're like, I know that story. I've heard that story. I've heard twelve sermons on that story. Uh, and maybe, you know, maybe today um, there, you won't hear anything new. Maybe, maybe you will. I don't know. But I will say is that opening our hearts to the idea that God might have something for you today and, and just being uh, open to whatever that might be. And so it could be something new or it could be something old that you're reminded of that God wants to do a work today through the Spirit uh, as we study the Scriptures as well. And so, uh, and really the emphasis I'm going to focus on today is uh, we were doing kind of a, we do a sermon collaboration or we, we, we started doing one kind of like before service. We've done, we do them at like 8.30 to, well, it ends up being 9.30, but we try to do it in like 30 minutes on Sunday mornings. And we were talking this morning, and we are like, this is like seven different sermons uh, that, that I could preach out of this today. And so we're going to do a, kind of a high-level view of this. But the, the, the end place that we're gonna, going to go to is focusing on God's victory over evil, that, that, that David killing Goliath or, or, or defeating Goliath is a picture, a testament of God's faithfulness in him defeating evil, and then in so doing so, that, that as, as a you know, 21st century follower of Jesus, how does that impact me, is that, that God was victorious over evil on the cross, and therefore, in my own life, when I encounter evil, uh, that, 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 that I have a choice to make, I can be fearful, I can be worried, uh, or I can overcome through the victory that is in Christ. And so, or uh, another way to think about it is, what do, you, what do you do when you're face to face with evil? And if we were to, to apply the application to David is we kill it, we destroy it, we, we defeat it as well. So we're, we're going to get into this. There is a lot of text today uh, on here, so just so you know, uh, because there's like 50 verses, we'll skip some of that just, just for sake of time, um, but we're, we'll go through it. So uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, or if you have your smartphones, you can uh, open it to there, or uh, it'll be on the screen. So verses 1 through 3, now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Sako, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sako and Sakah. Uh, in Ephes Damim. And Samuel, the men of Israel, were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in lines of battle against the Philippine, Philistines. Not Philippines, that's a different, that's a country now. Excuse me. Um, and the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. 
with a valley between them. Now, uh, not a ton to highlight here as we're getting a depiction on where they are at and from a geographic perspective. But there's two armies. There's the armies of the Philistines on one mountain. There's a valley between them. And then there is the armies of Israel uh, or the people of God on the other side. And really, it's uh, to, to, to give you this battle of good versus evil. It should feel this way. And if you were uh, someone that knew Hebrew and knew what the original words meant in Hebrew, the, 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 the words that are describing the Philistines mountain give the imagery of, of exile. And uh, the words that describe the mountain that the Israelites are on give you kind of the imagery of Eden. It's kind of like under a very nice tree is what it's described to be. Uh, if, if, if that's hard for you to imagine, if you saw the movie Lord of the Rings and there's the Battle of Minas Tirith where the people of Gondor are in this beautiful city of lights and they're about to fight against, there, there's not a mountain, so I know the Minas Tirith is on a, kind of a mountainside, but they're fighting against uh, the, 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 the people of Mordor and these orcs and all these other things, but it's good versus evil. They're in a battle. All right, so that's where, we're, that's where we start today. And verse 4, and he says, And there came from, out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron and his shield bearer went before him. And so naturally, if we've heard this story before, we, we know that G Goliath is coming out. And what's the thing that we notice about Goliath? What, what, what is interesting about Goliath? He's tall, right? He's a giant. He's very tall. Now, there is actually debate if you look at different old texts about how tall he was. Uh, so we, in this, our translations, it, w it would say that he's somewhere around like nine and a half feet tall. Now, when, when the uh, Hebrew writers in the early, early centuries, when they wrote the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, he was a little shorter back then. And so I don't know if he got taller with age or how, how it's right, but he might have been like six and a half feet tall back then. But regardless, he's, he's a, or it might be seven feet tall. He's, he's a tall lad, right? He's, a, he's still a giant. He's a, big, he's a big boy, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and he's called a champion. Now, it's interesting that we use this word, champion, uh, and it's been picked up in all of the English translations because the Hebrew actually uh, is, is rendered as the man of the in-between, which is fascinating uh, because he's actually the guy that's going to step out in the in-between. He's going to go from the bad mountain to go to the valley, and he stands in between the good mountain, the people of Israel, uh, and, uh, and, and the people of the, Phil the Philistines. The other thing, too, is if he's a giant, there's this crazy, this, this, this is a tangent, by the way, so I apologize I'm going down this, it might not even matter, but just for your own edification, just for fun, there's, this, there's these old stories about how, in, all the way back in Genesis, is how uh, the, these angels, these fallen angels, uh, had children with the women, the, the human women, and then yielded giants. And so in some ways, it's these heavenly and these heavenly beings and these uh, human beings, these in-between beings that are kind of connected. Regardless, we use the word champion. And he was their champion because he, I mean, who wants to really fight a guy that's nine and a half feet tall? Now, another, another thing, what word is repeated four times in the description of Goliath? Not that he's just tall. If you look at that text, what word is repeated? You can bring that, that, that back up. You'll, you'll notice it. What, what, what word is repeated? I believe it's four times. It's the word bronze. It's the word bronze. And you might think, okay, great. We're getting a beautiful description of his armor. And, um, and that is true. His, his helmet is bronze. Uh, his, 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 his coat of arms are, are bronze. His legs, his javelin, they're all bronze. Uh, but again, a lot of times the Hebrew writers, they're, they're going to use words that connect to other words that give us pictures that connect back to other things in the, in, in, in the Old Testament. And so the word bronze, uh, most or, or Hebrew words, they basically have three consonants as their, their root words. 
or as their root, uh, their root letters. And so if you see a, a, a word that has three cons- consonants, uh, sometimes uh, other words will have different vowel patterns that go connect between them, but they'll connect you to these different, these different images as well. And so the word bronze uh, actually has the same three root letters for the word snake, which you might be like, okay, why, why does this matter as well? Well, when you think about snakes, where, where is there a snake in the Bible? It's in, it's, in, it's in the garden, who is tempting uh, Adam and Eve, who is in some ways a picture of evil. Uh, he has 5,000 shekels, uh, and other translation, it is, these words shekels is, is, is like scaly. He has 5,000 scales all over his body. And so if you're, if you're a writer, like, uh, not only is Goliath this big, tall, bad guy who is challenging the people of Israel, but he also is giving this picture of the serpent in the garden, and this, which it also takes a greater theme of kind of like a, a, a chaos dragon type creature as well, which in, in, in summary is essentially just this, is that he is like the depiction of evil, who is challenging the, he's challenging the, the, the one true God. And so this is what he's doing. He is challenging the people of Israel. This is what he does in verse 8. He says, he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? So what? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that, will, that, that we may fight together. When Saul and all, the Israels heard, all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly af- afraid. Have you ever, ever just woken up just, just like with a daunting task facing you and you're just dreading it? Have you ever done that before? Where just something's in front of you and you just wake up and the first thought of your mind is that I have to deal with this today. And let's say you don't take care of it. And so the next day, and then 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 the next day, it's still there and you're still facing the same thing. This is what happens. This is what's happening in the story of David and Goliath, the people of Israel. It actually happens 40 days where the armies will go up on the mountain. Goliath will come down into the in-between or into the valley between the two places. He will challenge and ask for someone to come and to fight him. And the people of Israel, they don't know what to do because they don't feel or they don't think that they have someone that is capable of defeating this person who is evil, who is in front of them. And they face it day after day after day after day. And, uh, and, 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 and now we, we're not facing, n- not that I know of, maybe you are, maybe you're doing something crazy in western Kansas that I don't know of, but we're not facing nine and a half foot, we're not facing a nine and a half foot giant day after day. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like we, we're not going to a hillside uh, ready to go. Like that's, that, not, that might not be what you're dealing with today, but there are things in, in your life, there are things in my life that regularly rob us of God's presence and God's goodness in our life. They're robbing us of his joy. They rob us of his peace. They rob us of what God wants to do. And in some ways, it leaves us, like the people of Israel, greatly dismayed and potentially afraid. And so what do we do? What do we do? Do we just live here? Do we just let it happen to us? Do we just wait and hope it goes away? What do we do? And so in, in enters David. And it's funny because David comes out and it seems like there's this, this amazing, this, this just, uh, th- th- this incredible, or excuse me, Goliath comes out and he's just this epic person. He's just this epic, uh, he's this epic man who's coming to, 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 to fight. And what does David do? And so, uh, it's not on the screen, but verse 17, 18, and Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an an ephah of his parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp of your brothers. Also take these 10 cheeses to the commanders of their thousands and see if your brothers are well and bring some token uh, from them. He is an errand boy. 
David shows up, and he's taking care of the sheep back home, and his dad sends him to bring food, uh, bread and cheese to his brothers and to the commanders, and make sure that your brothers are okay. He does not seem like the rightful hero of this story or the rightful one who's going to come in and do something, uh, but, but, but he eventually will see the challenge of Goliath. Uh, his first question, actually, if you read this story, we're, I'm just kind of paraphrasing this, is that he's actually questioning what kind of reward would someone get from the king if they defeated Goliath? Because he's thinking, like, maybe I could, I might be able to, do, I might be able to do this. His brother even gets angry. The brother that 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 probably was supposed to be the one selected to be the next king of Israel, but instead God saw David's heart and chose him. Uh, and, uh, but in this moment, his older brother questions his motives and his heart. But truly, we'll see that David is coming and believing that the God of Israel will protect him, lead him, and guide him through this battle. And so word finally gets to Saul that David is asking some questions about uh, defeating Goliath. And in verse 31, this is the conversation that they have. He says this, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let, man's, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has not been a man of war from his youth, or for he has been a man of war from his youth. And so David's, basically David's words get around to him, and David says, hey, you know what, I know that you're fearful right now, I can see that you're afraid, I can see that you're dismayed, and David is, is still full of faith, and David says, hey, I, I'm going to do this, I can do this, I believe that I can do this, and David is like a good relief pitcher coming in for a tired arm here. He's like someone coming in saying, hey, Maybe at the beginning of the 40 days, maybe you had more faith. Maybe there was a strategy that you were considering, but now you are all fearful and you're all worried and you're all dismayed. And I am, I'm, I'm, but I'm ready. I'm ready to go. And, uh, and, but Saul says, hey, you can't do this. This guy's been fighting since he was young and you're young yourselves. And I would say this is that there always will be a reason of why you can't fight there always will be an excuse of why maybe you think you can't overcome what is in front of you. You're too young. You don't have enough time. You're not smart enough. You don't believe enough. There's another way. But the Israelites, they've been sitting here for 40 days. They've been sitting here for 40 days. And they, they probably have this longing for this battle to be over but they're just staying in the safe place of their mountain when really what is in front of them is that someone is going to have to fight. That someone is going to have to fight. And David says, hey, I'm going to be the one to do it as well. And as you think about your own life, I mean, naturally, one of the, the, one of the, natural, the natural applications of a story of David and Goliath, we often put ourselves in David's shoes and want to say, what giants do you face today? But I will say this, is that God calls his people to stand up against the evil in the world. A part of that is by declaring the good news and the gospel of Jesus to everyone that we can encounter, but it also a part of that is, is, is when we see injustice in our own lives, when we see evil in our own lives and in the lives of someone else, is that we stand up and we say, hey, no, that's, that's wrong. We don't do that. We don't stand for that, and we fight against that as well. Verse 34 he says, but David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions, plural, lions and bears. We are in the Wizard of Oz, my friends. There's just no tigers. 
And this un- uncircumcised Philistine uh, shall be like one of these, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and, the, for, the, and, the, and for the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to, to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. And it's interesting. And so, you know, D- Jake and I were talking this week about this sermon, and he's like, Lions and bears? There's no lions and bears. Where in, in, in Israel? What, do you, what are we talking about? Now, we did do some research. There's definitely a Syrian bear uh, that was there. And so Jake did more research to find this as well. But, I mean, honestly, it's crazy to think about the fact that you're a shepherd and you're fending off enemies from your sheep. And, uh, and you have this crazy testimony of the fact that God protected you and your sheep from lions and bears. But what, what we learn from this is that past faithfulness, the past faithfulness of God, gives confidence to the present day. Meaning that like, if you are needing and worried about something that is in front of you today, whether it be a giant, a lion, a bear, a chihuahua, if you're afraid of chihuahuas, whatever it is, like God's previous faithfulness should inspire you, should be a reminder to you, that he will be faithful today, that he will be faithful today, that God w- will be with him. And David is so confident here. And I believe that, that this story from his past has given him confidence that God will protect him in the future. And so what has God done in your life to give you hope for today? What has God done in your life that, that inspires faithfulness for you today, that he is, he is been faithful, therefore you will be faithful today, that he has come through and that he will do it again, that he will do it again, and he will, I, be, I believe it. Now, if you struggle with this, if you struggle with believing that God is faithful or even having a memory that God is faithful or a time that you can see God's faithfulness, I would say that you're probably giving credit to something or someone, uh, like your credit uh, for what helped you get through uh, was, has, has been in the wrong place. Uh, and it might be that you've given yourself too much credit, uh, or it might be that you're, you're, you're trusting in something else. How easy would it be in this moment for David to give himself credit for defeating the lion and the bear? I'm pretty awesome. I'm David. I defeated a lion. You can't say that you defeated a lion. I'm David. I defeated a bear. I mean, who's defeated a bear? I mean, honestly, if I gave you a choice, hey, we're going to put you in an arena between a lion or or a bear or Goliath, which one are you actually going to choose? I choose neither. None. I'm dying in in a second. Now, but 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 he's saying no. Like I, I'm going to be fine. Uh, but he could have easily said no. I'm I'm awesome. I was able to overcome that thing. But no, he would be giving credit in the in the wrong place that God protected him in this moment, and that God will protect you and has protected you. He's guided you along the way. It could mean the reason that you don't have a story is because you're a new believer, and. Uh, you're, you're new to following Jesus, and I would say in that moment that the, your first place that you l- look to as a sign of God's faithfulness that he's going to come through is that you look to your salvation, the fact that God saved you. That's the thing. Uh, there's, David will often say in other times where he says, return to me the joy of my salvation. Is it's a re- remembering, rejoice, take joy in again the fact that you have been saved by God through faith and that, that we get to experience life, new life with him because of what he's done. And I can experience that today as well. And, and maybe it's this, is that maybe you have stories that God has come through and maybe you just need to, to rub shoulders with and be around people and have them tell you their story about God, how God was faithful. That meaning like other people's stories uh, can inspire and encourage you and remind you of God's faithfulness. And so today, I don't know what you're facing. You might be facing something huge. You might be facing something small. But we all need reminders from time to time. And maybe you need a friend today. Maybe someone in your community group say, hey, tell me that story again of when God showed up in this way or when God showed up in that way. And that will help you along the way. And so then Saul says, hey, you're good to go, but I want you to use my armor. And then Saul clothed David with his armor. 
He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then, Saul, uh, then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. And so I actually remember I had this uh, children's Bible. I don't know what the name of it was, but I can remember the children's Bible. It was purple. And I remember the picture inside this kid's Bible where David was trying on uh, Saul's armor. And it was way too big for him. Like it was just like overly too big for him. And so I've always assumed that the reason why David didn't use his armor was because it was too big. Now, it probably was too big for him. Let's be honest, Saul was a head taller than everyone else in Israel, but the reason that the scriptures say is because he hadn't tested them. He hadn't used them to, 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 to fight with. He's a shepherd. I mean, he uses, he has a staff, he has his sling. He's like, what else does a man need? I'm good. I'm ready to go. I mean, I, I killed a bear with this. I should be able to kill a, 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 a giant with this. What's, what's even different with this? But David uses what he knows. And I think that's important where sometimes uh, uh, as, you, as you might be thinking about the things that you're dealing with or struggling with or the, the giant that might be in front of you today is we need to use what we know. We need to use uh, what I would call the old faithful things right here that we faithful, the faithfully the way that we fight evil with prayer, with loyalty to Jesus or obedience, with love, with grace. With, with steadfastness, with standing firm and knowing and, and, and believing on what is true as well. So then the fight happens, and, uh, and I love this, even though I just lost my place in my Bible. It's okay. I have it on here. He says this, you come to me, this is David, you come to me with a sword and, and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philippines this day to the birds of the air and to the beasts, wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly may know that the Lord saves with the sword and, with, and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. And so prior to this, this, this text, Goliath is name-calling David and saying, hey, why would you even bring this guy to fight me as well? And, and, and Goliath battles is with violence, with a sword and a spear, but David battles with the living God. And that, that we realize is that the battle is his and that God is the one who will get credit for delivering you into my hand. And so as you live your own life, like again, I, I don't imagine in your lifetime that you will be fighting physically a nine and a half foot giant called Goliath in the middle of a valley. And if you do, let me know. I'd like to watch that. I don't imagine that happening. It's not going to happen. But we have things that we fight with on a regular basis. We have things that we are dealing with. We have things that we struggle against in this world. And so what do you do when you face the giants of your life? What do you do when you face evil in this world? Are you like the majority of the people of Israel where you cower, where you, you, you're fearful, you're afraid, which I'll be at times, I do that. There are definitely times where I, I get into a rhythm or a cycle where I could be like the people of Israel, 40 days of waking up to the same thing and thinking fear, worry, shame. Or are you like David? Where you're like, no, I serve a God who is in control. I serve a God who the battle is his. I serve a God who has won. And no, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to fight, and I'm going to fight, and I'm going to trust him as well. And, and due to that, due to the overcoming of Christ and using that and, and through his power, that through whatever victory comes from it, that, that the world will know that there is a one true God, that there is a God. 
And, uh, and so when we fight against evil in this world, when we fight against giants in the world, the hope is that the world would see that there is a one true God. I, I, I face my giants, so when God comes through, the world will know who he really is. So what do you do when you face giants? I mean, what are some things that you do? What, what are some tr- tried and true old ways? Well, David prepared. First, he remembered what God had done. Second thing he did, and I don't have time, you can write down just Ephesians 6. You can write down Ephesians 6, which is uh, you put on, for us, we can put on the armor of God. I had friends um, in college who they literally will pray on the armor of God, like, like they would take time in the morning to pray on the armor of God, imagining the different things, putting on the belt of tr- truth, the shoes of peace, the helmet of salvation, uh, the sword of the spirit, and so on and so forth. But they would pray each of them and, and think about what, how, that would, how that would impact them as well. Uh, prayer, of course, being in his presence, um, leaning on friends. You know, I do think sometimes if you face the same thing, the same enemy, the same evil over and over and over again, that you're not intended to do it just on your own. You don't have to fight on your own. You have the Lord who's at your side, but we have community that's with us and that we can lean on, that we can fight with uh, along the way. In verse 48, he says, So when the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistines. Now, I don't know about you, but David ran towards Goliath. If, I was, if, I w- if it were me, I'm not running. I'm like, you know, walking slowly, looking back, thinking like, is this really what we should be doing here? But David's so sure, so confident in who the Lord is that he's running towards the battle. He's running because of the confidence and the faith that he has in the Lord. And David put his hand in his bag and took out the stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with the sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. And then David ran and stood over the Philistine, took out his own sword, drew it on its sheath, and killed him and cut his head off with it. When the Philistines saw that the champion was dead, they fled. And so David wins. Now, I will say, as a child again, I thought, how can you kill someone with a sling? You know, like that would be impossible. But then I thought, have you ever seen, there's like a reel on Instagram where a guy that's slinging, he's like slinging a sl- he's using a sling. He's slinging a sling. That's what, you, what do you do with a sling? You sling it. Uh, he's slinging a sling. But he, he, he's using a sling, and he's throwing something. I, I wish I had the video. I'm sorry. I failed you. I will try to, to I'll repost it on my, on my Instagram, okay? Uh, although, if, that, if I do that, you'll know that I'm not trying to get you to follow me because I don't post anything ever on my Instagram. But uh, the dude is just like, he's like throwing it. I mean, it looks like he's throwing a fastball. You know what I'm saying? And so I would imagine that David had some, some skill to be able to, to kill a wild animal with, with a sling, you know what I'm saying? So he's, it's almost like, a, like an arrow or like a, like a bullet being shot as well. So, but he does, it's, it's, it's still miraculous that this young boy is able to beat this incredible, uh, this, this incredible warrior as well. And then he cuts off his head. And, um, you know I, know, I know I briefly talked about how Goliath is kind of this picture of this serpent. And, uh, and then David is actually kind of a, a, a preview of, of this messianic king that we will eventually get in Jesus. And so, but in, in uh, Genesis 3, after um, the, the Adam and Eve, they, they, they disobey God, uh, they talk about how eventually the, the offspring of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And in some ways, David is this picture of the future victory that Jesus will have over, over sin and evil as well, with, with just cutting off the head of Goliath. Because it's this picture of him cutting off the head of this bronzy, this scaly, this serpent-type figure as well. And it gives us this future hope that is in Christ as well. And so, but as we wrap up, I don't know if I have to come up, but I just want to take a few moments. And, um, you know, I... I don't know what all of you are going through. I know what some of you are going through, honestly, but I don't know what all of you are going through. And um, I do, I, I just want to take a moment and just for us to pray over the things that you would describe as the giants in your life that you're facing. And maybe you're like, it's not, a gi- it's not at a giant level. It's okay. Like, maybe just praying over the evil that is in front of your life today. 
just taking a moment and say, seeing the evil that's in front of you and praying in full faith that God would have his, that have his victory. And I don't know what it is. Uh, it could be faith for something future, like a job. Like maybe you've been looking for a job for a while, or maybe you've been wanting to be married for a while, and, and you're still looking for that right person. Uh, maybe you've been hoping to have a, a child, like you've been trying to get pregnant, and that hasn't happened yet. You know, maybe maybe your giant uh, isn't something uh, like the evil in your life is actually caused by you, like that you're addicted to something, and it's g- gotten so big that... It's, it's something you face every single day, and it's something that you have, you have victory in Christ. You have forgiveness in Christ, but it's something that you haven't overcome yet. But with him, you can. With him, all things are possible. Maybe it's just life, hardship uh, in life today. Like maybe just financially, there's just a giant of debt in front of you, and you don't know what to do. And you don't know how to get out of it, but th- there's, a, there's a flourishing that God has for you at, with, with the way that you steward money, that he wants to use your resources to benefit his kingdom that you're not able to because you're stuck in spending and stuck with keeping up with the Joneses as well. Uh, maybe, maybe you're actually facing like legit evil like in your life right now. Like maybe you're facing abuse. Uh, maybe you're facing, um, maybe, maybe you're, you're being an abuser. In some way, and and it's time for you to say like to stop. And maybe that the, the, the one of the ways that you fight that giant is that there's the hurt from your your own life, the trauma from your own life is causing you to cause trauma on other people, and that you need to go and to learn enough about yourself to grow and go seek counseling. You'll get help so that you don't hurt people anymore. Uh, you know, maybe it's just that you see injustice in this world. And that you you want you want you want righteousness to prevail. You want justice to prevail. And I there could be so many more. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a few moments. If you don't mind underscoring a little bit or turn on that pad uh, for just a second, and I'm just gonna lead us to, to pray. If you if someone that you if you if you don't want to do it alone too, like maybe you're the only one. You feel like you you've been doing you you've been you've been fighting this battle for a while, and you feel alone. And maybe, like, you're, you're, you, you need someone to come alongside of you. And, again, you might be new here. Like, you can tap a shoulder and say, hey, someone come pray with me. Or if you have someone in your community group that the Lord puts on your heart right now that, that you know of what they're walking through and you want to come and just go over to them and pray with them. Um, the room is free to move about the cabin, as we say, if that's something that you need to do. This is, uh, we don't do this every week, so if this is your first time, this is freaking you out. I'm sorry, we're not trying to freak you out. We're just... There's real issues. There's real evil that, is, that has been done to us, and sometimes there's real evil that we have been that we we we've contributed to in the world, and that we want to overcome it because God calls us to something else. And so, if that's you today, uh, we're gonna do it. But if you if uh, yeah, so as the Lord moves in these last two songs, you can this this prayer can continue. But right now, um, would you just pray with me? So. I'm just gonna invite you to first first I'm, just, I'm gonna invite you to name not out loud, but in your mind, just to name whatever giant or whatever thing that is evil in front of you. Just to name it. And before we even pray over, uh, before you even pray over for God to take that away or for God to overcome it or to sh- God show you what victory looks like, there is, uh, I'm actually gonna encourage you to look back and to, 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 to answer this question is, God, where have you been faithful before? God, where have you been faithful in the past? Where has God been faithful in your own life where he's shown up? And if you don't have an answer, the, the first place you can look at is the fact that he saves you If you haven't experienced the salvation of Jesus, cry out to Jesus. Jesus, I believe that you're my saving king. And then now, after acknowledging the fact that, God, you've been faithful. God, you've shown up in the past that you'll be faithful in this next thing, God. God, we pray that, 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 that you would have the victory over whatever that thing was that you named before. 
Jesus, you'd have victory over my job. God, Jesus, you'd have victory over my addiction. God, you'd have victory over the, the hurt, the trauma, the abuse I've experienced in my life. Lord, you'd have victory uh, over the injustice that we see in the world. God, you'd have victory over my illness or my disease, God. God, Jesus, you'd have victory over, God, you have victory, you have won. So Lord Jesus, we do believe that the victory truly is in you and that you have, you have won on the cross. And we love you. God, I pray for our people that you would strengthen them by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, that you would give them the courage like King David have to run towards the things, to run towards the battle. That we would be a people that wouldn't stand for injustice, for evil in the world, but we'd be standing for goodness and light and righteousness. And sometimes for us to do that, it starts in our own lives. And so, God, that we would be people of light. We'd be people of love. We'd be people of righteousness. And so, God, would you sanctify us today? God, would you move today in our lives? And, God, would you let us have victory over the things that we have declared today? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as, as we uh, respond today, I'm just going to invite you. Uh, we have communion. And so... If you're a believer, would invite you to come up. There's tables on each uh, on each side of me, and during the next two songs, you're welcome to come in and to remember the fact that Jesus has won, that He has won, that He was victorious. He was victorious over sin and evil and death, and that we can remember His victory, and it can strengthen us and empower us as we remember His sacrifice on the cross, body broken, blood shed. If you need someone to pray with you, I know today might evoke or bring up some emotion or, or some feelings. There'll be people in the back two corners that would love to pray. Or again, if there's someone here that you want to pray with you that you're more comfortable with or that you know that from your community group or just from friendships, if, go and find them. Go pray with them as well. And then we're going to sing. So would you stand with me as we uh, continue our service?